Good evening to everybody. Welcome to the online chat program of the Turkish Association for Landscape Architecture, Education and Science. Tonight we are having an international guest in our program, Jerome de Vries from the Netherlands. Jerome will join our program very soon. Hi, hi. Hi, Jerome. Hi, hi. I try to switch the camera a bit. Okay, can you? Yeah. yeah. Uh, that, that's much. That's yeah, I'll, I'll have to take something. One moment. Okay. It's perfect now. This is better. Uh, yeah, yeah. Yes. Uh, yeah. Good so, evening again. Welcome to our program. Can you hear me well? Yes, I hear you well. How about you? Okay. That's good. Okay. So let me just introduce the program to our, to our audience. Uh, the people that yeah. are coming in the program. Uh, let me introduce the program and then listen to the chair. Okay. Uh, good, yeah. good evening to everybody. Uh, welcome to the online chat program of the Turkish Association for Landscape Architecture, Education and Science. In this program, we are talking with people, uh, both uh, national uh, guests and international guests. Tonight, uh, we have an international guest, uh, Jeron de Vries from the Netherlands. Uh, Jeron uh, is a very active person, actually, in the Netherlands. Uh, he's a teaching staff. He's also running a design office. So I think he's the right person to talk both about the education and also the professional practice of landscape architecture in the Netherlands. Uh, with Jeron, uh, our program uh, will be consisting of uh, two parts, actually. In the first part, I will be asking some questions to Jeron about the uh, education and also the professional mm -hmm. practice. And in the, in the second part of the program, the audience, I mean, you will be able to, uh, you, will be, you will have the opportunity to ask questions uh, to Sharon. So let's uh, start with our guest. Sharon, uh, thank you very much for accepting our invitation to be our guest tonight. Yes, so it's fun. I, I hope everything is all right there. Yeah, it's, it's, the weather is good. The, it's not too busy. Holiday is coming, so it's, it's fine. Yeah. It, it's nice. So could you yeah. please uh, introduce yourself first, uh, Gerard? Yeah. Well, I, I basically I'm a landscape architect and a landscape ecologist. And uh, what I was uh, educated here in Wageningen at uh, Wageningen University in the 70s. And uh, I have focused in my career both on teaching I taught at Larestein and also at Wageningen University and for some time I was director of the landscape program. Um, I, at the same time, in parallel, I run my office, first my own office and then together with a set of partners in the DG group. And uh, I also, in the later phase of my career, I started with research and I was really inclined to see how you could research by designing. And during my last years at the university, I coordinated a research group on uh, sustainable food planning for metropoles. Um, now I'm mainly retired from all the teaching and uh, education stuff, but I am a director researcher at the Lenoto Institute, and that's a foundation that promotes uh, knowledge and research and teaching expertise in the field of landscape in general. 
And as Lenota, we organize uh, the Lenota Forum, but also support schools. Uh, we organize the doctoral colloquium. Uh, we are proposing e-lectures on different subjects. Uh, so uh, that's what I'm ma mainly doing now. And I'm involved in a set of uh, Erasmus Plus uh, strategic partnerships on coastal planning and also on landscape democracy. So that's, uh, and I'm an independent researcher now for myself. Okay. Yeah. Actually, we, we, I think we first met with you in this Lenotra project, and in my opinion, mm -hmm. it's a really big and a very uh, important project to raise the profile of landscape architecture, across yeah, Europe, yeah, not only helps. across Europe, but also in the world, in my opinion. And at the moment, you are the director of that institute. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So. Okay. Yeah, we had a series of projects in which you also were involved, and it started actually in 2001. And um, by European funding, we provide a lot of opportunities for academics to travel and to meet and to, to work together on the competences and the programs and references and best, pro best practice and so on. So it really supported the whole academic community uh, in a good way. And we, I think we are still profiting from this. Also, when we develop new projects, we know the partners, we have a good network. So. It really helps, yeah. yeah it, uh, it has been also very good networking opportunities for all the schools in Europe and beyond, actually. So let's start by talking about the landscape architecture education in the Netherlands, uh, Jérôme. Uh, yeah, yeah. When, uh, when did uh, landscape architecture education in which school uh, start in the Netherlands? What is the story? Maybe in the context of uh, Europe, uh, you can uh, tell us something. Yeah, it's... Uh... Well, actually, it started right opposite where I live now, here on the other side of the road. And it started, well, over 100 years ago, in 1896. There was a secondary school which made a separate department on horticulture. And then they, uh, they had a staff, and that was a landscape designer, landscape architect, Springer. And he was the first teacher there in... Well, around before 1900 already. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then um, there came the second teacher was Harte Gijs, And he really started up the education in planting and designing and so on. He, he Actually, he built his house next to my house now, oh. on the other side in 1904. <laughs> and he wrote a book on, uh, here, here the book is from by Harte Gijs on planting design and all the, all the plant uh, types and also with design instructions on gardens and infrastructure and so on already in 1904. So, so he, he was, so then it really started, but then it was still called garden art. Okay. And then um, as a successor to uh, Hart of Heijs, in 1904, it became an institute of higher education for agriculture, horticulture, and forestry. And uh, then uh, Bijhauer, that's oh, uh, first a, a lecturer and later a professor, he, he taught from 1935 to 1966. So that's over 30 years. Yeah. And he, he really uh, was involved in urban planning and collaboration with architects and, uh, and so on. And after him came Meto Vroom, who you already know because he was in Antalya yeah. uh, some years ago. And um, Meto, he really um, made a connection with the uh, United States. He, he was there in uh, Harvard, I think, uh, for some years. He was taught by McHark also. So he really brought in the system thinking and the... Uh, uh, academic and research thinking into the discipline then. So that was in the 1960s, uh, early 1960s. Mm -hmm. So, um, and, and I think Bayhauer, he really laid the foundation and he got this opportunity because at that time there were, there were the new polders. A part of the sea was, uh, well, it was a land reclamation by the Dutch uh, nation. And these uh, polders had to be well, redesigned, redeveloped, and so on. And landscape architects had a, a role in that. Okay. Uh, so that was the, the start. 
Yeah, yeah. What about the first officially uh, um, uh, official school of landscape architecture? I think it was in the Wageningen University, right? Yeah, yeah. It's also in uh, Wageningen, and uh, I think yeah, I think uh, in 1948 there was the first formal recognition of garden and landscape architecture as an academic discipline. So it started some 50 years before as a garden art and, and designing and teach it, and drawing and those kinds of things and planting. But really the academic start was in 1948. Okay. So now how many landscape architecture schools are there in the, in the Netherlands in total? Uh, in yeah, there, there, is, there are about five, I think, but they're all very different. Okay because they have different backgrounds. Uh, okay, I spoke first now about Wageningen University, who had a background in her horticulture, later in agriculture, and then in life science now. But we have uh, Van Hal Larenstein, of, uh, formerly it was Boskoop, uh, the school. And that's also a very old school, and that uh, also uh, originated from horticulture. And it's now called Van Hal Larenstein, with oh, still um, a good foundation in planting and, and those kind of things. Mm -hmm. And then we have uh, one school, and that's quite new, is uh, the, in the school in Den Bosch. It's a higher education, agricultural education. Uh, and they have a course in landscape design since a year of 10, 15 maybe. And that's only a bachelor program, a four years bachelor program. And apart from this, we have two more uh, master programs. One is in the Technical University of Delft. Mm -hmm. So that is really in the context of urban planning and architecture. And one is in the Academy of Arts in Amsterdam. And that's in the tradition of the Bose Arts. And that is really embedded in uh, urban planning, uh, architecture and landscape architecture but it's really more about your uh, perso personal profile and so. so. So we have really five really different schools. And of course the basis is that there's a landscape architecture program, but because the students are uh, learning in the context of a whole school, they adapt or they adopt different kinds of competences as well. In Wageningen, the life science, in uh, Van Hallerstein, very much the management and the planting design. In the academy, your personal profile as an artist and a, a designer. At uh, TU Delft, very much, they're very strong in research. And in Hassan Bos, it's really, uh, really down to earth, uh, practical uh, design oriented program. So, so these are yeah. the five programs. Okay. Uh, with reference to the students, uh, how many students are enrolled every year in, in these programs and how uh, do they, these students come to the program? Through a central examination or uh, through a, uh, an, a, sele a selection examination? The, well, they, they, they used, select, yeah, yeah. No, there, there used to be some selection, uh, but it's changed in many years already. I think for the bachelor program, there's not a specific uh, selection because when you pass your secondary school exam, you're allowed to enter a bachelor program. So for Leimerstein and for Haas and Bos, um, you just can enter. And um, then also, I think for Wageningen, you, you can enter the bachelor program uh, when you finish your exams at the secondary school. But for the master program, there is a selection. And of course, uh, admittance is uh, whether you have uh, achieved your bachelor graduation. And there are some additional uh, demands because you have to have high marks. Yeah. I think above seven uh, from 10 or something like that. And um, also in the master programs, uh, people, they, uh, students can come in also from uh, Belgian schools and they can finalize either in Amsterdam or in Delft or in uh, Wageningen. And the master programs, they are generally two years programs, but only in Amsterdam it's four years because this is a program in concurrency. So the whole four years you work 
at the same time that you study. So you have to find a job at the landscape architecture office. And in the meantime, you, you, you do your studies. Uh, I think, of course, uh, students from other European countries, EU countries can come for ma to study masters. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. Follow in a process. Yeah. Yeah, the, the students come from China also, from South America. They come from uh, different countries in Europe. Uh, but then they still have to adapt uh, to these uh, demands and a certain level of English. Because the master programs, they're all taught in English. Uh, the bachelor programs are, well, it's a bit different, but most of them are taught in, uh, in Dutch. Mm -hmm. yeah. What about the teaching stuff? I mean, uh, if the, all teaching stuff are full-time stuff or some of them are teaching, but at the same time running an office or, uh, or external? Yeah, it is, it's, it's quite different. Uh, if you look at uh, Academy of Arts, it's mainly visiting professors and visiting staff. People have an office and they come in for lectures or modules and, and so on. There's a very, a very limited staff just to, for this main coordination and the head of the department and so. So that's quite, quite a lean organization. Um, then for uh, the other schools, uh, there are some full-time staff, or, but also in Netherlands we have many part-time staff always. And so, for instance, in Larsen we had half people who really only worked at the university and the other half had uh, part-time jobs because they also had an office themselves. And apart from that, we had, well, in my time, we had 40 guest lecturers who were coming for one day or, or some lectures, or it was quite, quite a well, kind of shield around it uh, with all the guest lectures. Uh, and, oh, okay. Yeah, the same goes a bit for Wageningen and Delft, although there, uh, because they are more involved in research, they, they have more their own staff also because they have to combine research and teaching. Yeah. Okay. Uh, what about the curriculum? Uh, so uh, they are uh, four years schools, right? Or three years uh, plus two, first of all, in terms yeah, of the yeah, structure. Yeah. And uh, about the, uh, the course uh, curriculum, I mean, uh, the, the programs are course-based or module-based. What type of uh, education is offered? Yeah, it's, it's mainly, mainly uh, module-based. Um, and um, the interesting thing, or the strange thing, oh, well, the, the, all these programs, they have some mixture in, in themselves. Um, because, for instance, if I take uh, Van Hal Arenstein, we start with uh, a first year, and it's a combination of landscape management, landscape design, landscape construction. Um, and, and then students opt for a certain uh, strand or direction, and then they go on. For instance, in, Wa in Wageningen, uh, there's a combined bachelor of spatial planning and land use planning and landscape architecture. And then in the master, they really go for the specialization in landscape architecture. So, so you always start with a mix. In Amsterdam, for instance, it's your first year is a combination of architecture, urban planning, and landscape architecture. And then you opt for a certain specialization. Mm -hmm. okay. uh, you know, the stakeholder involvement is uh, important, especially in the mm -hmm. Bologna process and in these, all these quality assurance, even for accreditation. Mm -hmm. How is that in the Netherlands? I mean, uh, in the vision of the programs, how is the stakeholder involved? Yeah, there is what almost all schools have is some kind of external advisory committee. And in this advisory committee, uh, there are people from uh, offices or also from uh, local authorities, uh, NGOs, and, and what, for instance, at Larsen, we try to find some kind of selection of small office, a big office, uh, somebody from a local authority, so, so a mix. And the other schools also have that. And apart from this, there is also an advisor, internal advisory committee with the students and the staff and uh, no stakeholders. That's only students and staff then. And, um, but for the quality control, um, there is every 
six years or two years, four years, so it changes all the time a bit. There is um, also a re peer review of an external review committee. And that's part of the whole recognition and accreditation process. And they come and they then um, act as external stakeholders from the profession and they see how the program is working and, and so on. And, and yeah. Yeah. carry on. Oh yeah, and, and during this, uh, for instance, uh, I was, for instance, uh, in this visits for the Belgian programs, but also, of course, as a director, I had to do the Dutch uh, programs. And um, then this external panel speaks with uh, graduates, with the students, with uh, also the people from the field, so the, the commissioners, and they, they ask them about the results of the program and so on. So that's, that's a structural peer review. And from this review, there, uh, every time there are a lot of recommendations and the school is following up these recommendations too, and they have to also report on that, also for the next review, whether they did it or responded or something like that. Yeah, I think uh, more or less the same in all these external peer review programs. Actually, my last question about the, this educational part of our talk was about the accreditation. I think oh, yeah, yeah. what you have just described is a part of the accreditation of the program, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So, so we have this uh, NVAO, that's the National Flemish, the Netherlands Flemish Validation and Accreditation or Organization. So that's, that's the, um, that's the, the official state was national or uh, both uh, for two countries uh, body that um, approves a program and if you're approved you can be funded by the government if you're not approved you have uh, you, you have a problem or you at least you have to solve your own financial things and um, sometimes it happens that uh, programs are really uh, found negative and then they have some time to improve themselves and they, if they don't recover, they be cut out of all the budget uh, systems. And this national body that, um, that gives the guidelines and the questions uh, that the review panels should uh, address and uh, this committee, uh, I, was, I chaired several times this committee, and then you have these guidelines from the National Accreditation Organization. And uh, nowadays, uh, the schools organize themselves this process of review and evaluation, and then they submit this report to the MVAO, and then the MVAO asks questions or they, they check it, and uh, then they make a decision on their further accreditation or not. Uh, that accreditation body uh, only accredits landscape architecture programs or for other No, it's, it's all, it's, it's just for all schools, okay. uh, all programs. Actually, it uh, has changed a bit because um, now there are two types of uh, accreditations. One is the institutional accreditation that goes for the whole school all or school. university. Yeah. yeah. And then there is a peer review uh, uh, accreditation for the programs. And that's lighter uh, because then, of course, the whole uh, institutional framework and body, it's, it's, well, it's solid or at least it's approved or not approved. And um, then these uh, program accreditations, they, they are leaner and these are done by this committee. And in this committee, uh, for instance, there's a landscape architect at least, or uh, somebody from a uh, local authority as in the field of landscape. But also there is somebody who is in uh, pedagogics, uh, just a teaching expert. Mm -hmm. um, so they have, uh, and we have a student also in this committee. This, uh, yeah. So I, I assume all the schools in the Netherlands, uh, schools of landscape architecture, are accredited because they are not many. Yeah, 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 yeah. This are. So, there were no problems. No, no. Some oh, were yes. good or excellent. Or, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's good. Uh, one point is very important. You mentioned that uh, there is a governmental funding uh, yeah. uh, for accredited programs. Is it a huge amount? And what happens if uh, a program is not accredited? Then it is closed down or. Uh, 
Yeah, then the funding stops. So that's uh, yeah, that's quite clear. <laughs> but still able to survive, or? Well, and um, in general, because there were some programs that were very bad, but not in the field of landscape architecture, and then the institution decides, well, we stop this program, and uh, some still some students may be in it, and they make a solution that they can find uh, finish their uh, degree, and then it stops. So, okay. uh, we have a question from the audience actually about the internship of the students. Mm -hmm. in, 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 in the programs, do you have internship period during the study years? And yeah, yeah. In bachelor's years? Or master's? Yeah, in, uh, in the bachelor program, it's, uh, for instance, at last time we have a half a year of internship. Uh, in Hust and Boss, it is combined with the final project, I think. So it's, it's almost a year that they have the internship. And they also often do their final project at the same office or same organization that uh, mm -hmm. they do the internship. Mm -hmm. In um, the other masters, um, the, well, it, it varies between three and six months, uh, the internship. But of course, in the academy, it's four years, but only half time then. So, yeah. mm -hmm. okay. so there is a strong internship period. In the yeah, 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 programs so, in yeah, yeah, yeah. OK. okay. So uh, let's go to the professional practice. Uh, stop oh, yeah. here talking about the education. Maybe we, have, we may have questions from the audience later on. Mm -hmm. Is landscape architecture an officially recognized profession by law in the Netherlands? Yeah, it, it is an official. Uh, well, the, t the title, there's a title protection of the title of landscape architect. And there was made a general law on the title of architects, urban planners, and landscape architects and interior designers. That was from 1996, I think, something like that. And um, everybody can um, do the profession. You can do designs and activities and so on. But this law says you can only call yourself a landscape architect if you meet these, um, these criteria. And the criteria are that you have a master program in landscape architecture. And in the regulations, it's defined which schools do, the, do, do meet these criteria. So that's Wageningen University and uh, Amsterdam and TU Delft. And um, from the other schools, officially, you may call yourself a landscape designer or a landscape manager or a landscape engineer or those kinds of things. Mm -hmm. But you're not allowed to call yourself a landscape architect. Ah. But still, you can do the same jobs. That's oh. So, well, it's interesting. I mean, so unless you do a master's uh, uh, degree, you are not able to use the landscape architecture title and perform the profession. No, yeah, no, no. no. Okay, so well, you can, you can do, there, there is one exception. For instance, if you already work for a long time and you only had a bachelor or you had nothing, you can do a special exam at um, there's a general office that's a foundation for the registration of architects, etc. And you can do a national exam. So if you say, well, I, I worked for so many years, I do so many projects, okay, I'll do this separate uh, exam. Okay. Well, it's, it's very similar to, to German, I think. Unless you finish the five yeah, years, yeah, yeah. three plus yeah. two, you are not able to perform the profession. So it's yeah, very yeah. similar to the situation in Germany. Yeah, and there's one other thing is that you can only enter it after uh, a traineeship period of two years. And that's re more recent. I, I will uh, come I back think... to that point uh, okay. later on. Uh, okay. Yeah, uh, we know German landscape architecture profession is very well established in the Netherlands, actually. So, mm, what yeah. is the story behind that? I mean, how, how, the, how, how did this, it come? Uh, yeah, actually, it, it, it has a bit to do with our national profile because um, we have this lots of land below sea level. We have to defend it, we have to construct it with the polders and so on. And I think the, um, the, the land reclamation in the 50s and 60s, with these huge new land polders developed, but also a bit before, um, 
they gave an opportunity to landscape architects to show that they could design cities or in combination with architects and made uh, infrastructure um, embedded in the landscape and designed the landscape structure and so on. So I think that this was a great advantage at the start that they could show that that was their capacity. And um, in, this, in this project, they have a long time collaboration with architects as well and urban planners. Bayer, he collaborated on uh, making new towns together with architects and, uh, and other people. And also uh, Mino Huys, a very well-known landscape architect, she also did it. And they did many times the green amenities, but also the landscape planning and the planning along the roads. And um, after that period, there was a time that um, there was a lot of urban development in, uh, in the Netherlands. The population was growing, the cities were growing. And somehow the urban planners forgot their design tasks. They were very much um, involved in the regulations and all the legal things and so on, but they forgot the design aspect. And then uh, there was a gap and landscape architects, they took up this opportunity to make designs for urban areas and urban open space and those kinds of things. So they really um, changed their profile, they broadened their profile from, from the rural aspect to really the urban aspect as well. And um, this, this whole development was really supported by a very strong uh, publication strategy of every year yearbooks about the projects, uh, competitions also on a national level. And what happened in the 80s that there were huge competitions, for instance, on the uh, river structures in the Netherlands or the development of the countryside and so on. And the outcomes of these uh, competitions, they were translated into national policies and natural laws also. Uh, for instance, uh, the space for the river and the river uh, bed uh, basin management, those kinds of things. And the landscape architects really laid the foundation for that. So, so they strengthened their profile by their concepts and the way uh, of working. And this resulted, for instance, in a, a, a national advisor for the landscape. And he was, or he or she, uh, now it's the she, I think, and um, very close to the government and the policies. So we, we really had a good profile there. Where is, where is her position actually in the government? I mean, a kind of advisor to the, the Queen? Or? Yeah, it's an advisor. That we have a national advisor for architecture and there's a national advisor for the landscape. Oh, nice. And I think that's it, more or less for the spatial aspects. Okay. Yes. Okay. Okay. And, and for instance, uh, this national advisor starts research projects or um, for instance, we have these ideas about how we, do we arrange the coast or how we deal with climate change and so on. And the national advisor has some, allocated some budget and then there are design proposals uh, and they, they can use. And we also, as a national association, we, uh, we took a commission from the government uh, for the new national spatial strategy. Mm -hmm. So there were five or six, nay, ten teams working on main challenges in the, in the landscape. And actually, um, parts of these uh, proposals, they are included now, integrated in the new lands landscape uh, spatial policy of the Netherlands. So, so it's really, it's a, an input that's validated, yeah. It's, it's uh, well, we have talked to, to, talked to you many times, uh, uh, Jerome, but I have not heard about this. That is, that's very okay. interesting. <laughs> I think it's, that's yeah. unique to the Netherlands. And I have not heard any other example like a national uh, landscape architecture advisor in any country. I don't know mm. if there are any in other countries. I'm not quite sure in other, no, I don't think in other countries they have it. I but, think that uh, explains why landscape yeah, architecture yeah. also is so, why it's so strong in the Netherlands. So it's, it's, it's yeah, yeah. Um, the, my next question is about the, the professional practice, uh, Jaron. Uh, yeah. Are graduates eligible to practice the profession uh, immediately upon the graduation, or should they take an internship, or should they take any examination? Mm -hmm. Also, are there uh, different levels of uh, practice 
for instance, for uh, smaller scale design projects or uh, the, the, the big scale design project? Is there any mm -hmm. distinction regarding the competencies of graduates? Yeah, there is no formal. I think when you graduate, you can just work. So th there's no problem if uh, if you want to if you do Lyrstein or even if you don't really graduate, you can start a landscape landscape office or design office so so that's that's no no problem but can you design um, a project unless you are graduated can you can you draw a design project officially unless you are graduated well it depends on the commissioner of course but uh, if i want to design a garden for a hotel or uh, for for a municipality well it's up to them sometimes when there is uh, this official call they say they have quality requirements for the team, for instance. Mm -hmm. And then they might say, well, we really want to have a landscape architect on the team, but they might also say we also need a, a landscape ecologist and an ecologist on the team. So, so they can make requirements. But that is all, only if it's put out to contract officially. If it's just a commission by uh, a local authority, they can say, well, I have this uh, park area, I want to have a design, and there's an office, or they can invite three offices and say, well, I, I like this office, or I think it's very good in, in these kind of designs, they just can do it. So it's, okay. it's not very formally regulated, but for the main, the important national commissions or uh, also, the big cities, they often require in the team uh, a, a registered uh, landscape architect and, uh, from the title. So, open graduation, there is no formal uh, requirement like an additional internship or an examination? No, but, no, because only if you want to have the title, you have to ah, right. do the two years of traineeship. So. so, if you want to be in the register, uh, so like in the chamber, um, then you really have to do the two years internship, except from the Amsterdam Academy, because they already had that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so. okay. But if you don't, don't care about the title, it's, it's okay. And actually there are now uh, 760 uh, registered landscape architects in this uh, national uh, register. Yeah. Could, you, could you please repeat the number? 760, something like 760 that. 760 landscape architects. Yeah, yeah. Uh, okay. And we have so, a population of 17, 18 million, something like that. So from what you have said, I understand, Jerome, that there is not a clear distinction between the works that can be done between the landscape architects or landscape designers or managers. I mean, those who completed the master's degree, those between those who completed the master's degree and not completed the master's degree. Well, there, there is, of course, a distinction, but... Uh, the work, for instance, if, if you have an office, there might be two landscape architects with a master title and who are registered. Maybe you have five landscape designers and two landscape engineers. And so, so the office is often a combination of different people. Okay. And maybe you have an urban planner and an urban designer. And uh, so it's, it's and, and many of the bigger projects, you mainly work in interdisciplinary teams. So. Mm -hmm. But, um, but for the work, uh, for instance, if you have this national official commission, it's given to the office because of they have these requirements of this uh, landscape architect title person. And then, um, of course, the team works together, but the, uh, the landscape architect is responsible then for all the work. All right, uh, all right. I, yeah. I understand. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about the professional or, uh, association in the Netherlands? Uh, yeah. And how many, you, you have you know, just mentioned 760 members to the association. Well, this, uh, there are 760 in the register, okay. but uh, in the national association, we have 450 members, All right. of which 350 are in the register. So it's two different things. Yeah. So the total number Actually, of graduates and the members. There is a distinction. Between the well, the graduates uh, of all the um, all the schools, maybe there are two thousand or something like that. Oh, okay. At this moment, working in all kinds of things. Okay. But only a part of them are in the register. 
and only a part of them are member of the national association, but everybody can become a member of the national association. So it's because not it's, an it's, obligation to be a member to the national no, association no, no. to practice. Now, even if you are a garden lover, yes. you can become a member of the national association. Oh, really? Oh. Yeah. But if the, they have two types of members, they have individual members and they have office members. And the office members, they need to be in the register. And uh, so they have, it's a very open, it's a bit confusing organization, but yeah. it's yeah. normal. Uh, so, any member, so it could be a landscape historian, or it could be a garden lover, or it, it could be anybody, a journalist. They can all become members of the association, but they cannot be these official office members uh, in this. Oh, okay. okay, so uh, I'm a little bit confused about the mission of the uh, professional association. So yeah. it's, it's just... Yes. Uh, yeah. The mission is actually promoting uh, garden and landscape architecture in the broadest sense. Okay. So it's not really uh, 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 like uh, the BLA, the German association. That's really an association of the landscape architects only. And in the Netherlands, it's broader, and that it has a historic uh, has a historic connotation of this because first there were two associations: the formal Dutch BDLA, the BNT. And there was uh, an association of people who are very much into landscape, and they merged. Okay. So that's why you have now these two types of members in the same association. All but, right. Uh, well, this, our situation is similar to the, to the to German, actually. Only the landscape yeah, architects yeah, yeah, can yeah, be I the members so, yeah. of the Chamber of Landscape, yeah. landscape Architects. Okay. What about the employment uh, of landscape architects in the Netherlands? Is there any employment problem in the Netherlands for landscape architects or no. designers or managers? Uh... I, had, I had a look at a survey, it was last year, of the members of the association. And I think of the uh, members there were, well, it was 17, so it's maybe it's one and a half, two percent was unemployed at that time. Okay. But of course you have also the young graduates who are still finding a job. Mm -hmm. And in general, the employment is, is quite good in the Netherlands. It was below, in general, it was below 4%, but for higher educated, it was even lower. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's not really uh, a thing. Of course, the problem is often if you find the right job, but yeah. Yeah. <laughs> the, the real job, uh, that you want, because often with my graduates, they, they have these very high aspirations and then they have to start at the beginning in the office. And uh, so, so it's, in the beginning, they have some adaption problems because they have this big image of how, how they should develop. But first they have to, of course, to learn and to settle in and to see what they really want. So, but sometimes there is a friction uh, between them, yeah. Okay. Well, before proceeding to the EU issues, there is a question from the audience, from Mustafa Akar mm -hmm. from Martin University. Are there any other NGOs related to landscape architecture, like I think our, our association? Yeah, there is. Well, there is not. Of, case, of course, there are foundations, um, for instance, promoting aspects of landscape. Uh, but there's not a real, there's not a different NGO for landscape designers or landscape managers or so. There, there are other types of NGOs for, for instance, for historical gardens. Um, there's an association to uh, really promote the value of historical gardens and who uh, make sure their research is done. Uh, there's advice on, I often, when I did a project in an existing park, they, there can people from this association in, but they, they're very specific uh, on search. So there's not another general NGO on landscape design or landscape management. Okay. There are regional ones who, for instance, they protect regional landscapes and, uh, and of course there's more a landscape ecology oriented uh, association, mm -hmm. but there's not, not a general one, no. Okay, uh, the Netherlands is a, a member, a EU member, 
Uh, yeah, my yeah, question yeah, yeah, now yeah. is, uh, 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 again, a landscape architecture, a legally recognized profession in the U EU. And the Dutch landscape architects are able to work in other EU countries, like in the Netherlands. Yeah. Well, the, the EU uh, development of the recognition is, is still in process. Um, it's, for instance, for doctors and architects, there is an EU-wide uh, recognition. And that is in the Professional Qualification Directive system. And in order to get into that system, you need at least regulation in, um, I think, half of the European countries. Okay. And at this moment, the, it's, it's only seven countries that have a regulated profession for landscape architecture. In France, we have this Piagiste Concepteur. In Germany, it's regulated. In Hungary, it's regulated. In Iceland, it's regulated. In Italy, you have Paysagista. Yep. In France uh, and Netherlands and Slovakia. So, so there, there are some countries it's regulated. And if we would have more countries that's regulated, then you can go for this general step in Europe to get a regulated um, um, profession. So for the moment now, it's, um, you have to apply, if, for instance, if I want to work in Germany, I have to apply and have to give my um, national re recognition to the BDA, and they check it and they say, okay, you're recognized in Germany. So there is a formal procedure for that. You are not uh, automatically entitled to go to Germany and perform the profession. I, ca I can automatically go because Dutch landscape architects, they work a lot all, all over yeah, Europe. Yeah, yeah. So, and, and whenever there's a competition or there's a call, well, you, you submit and, and then you're allowed to, to work there as a landscape architecture team. In many cases, we look for a local partner in order to do the real, uh, more down to earth things, of course. But, um, but if I want to establish myself, for instance, if I want to live in Germany and I work in Germany, then I need this uh, recognition by the BDA, and then I have to uh, submit my papers off. Or if I go to France, I have to be recognized there. Mm -hmm. But if I just stay here and I work, I can work everywhere. Yeah. So actually, my next, next question is about the competitiveness. We know that oh, yeah. the Dutch landscape architecture is very competitive internationally. What is mm -hmm. specific about the landscape design approach in the Netherlands, which helps them to be internationally competitive? Yeah. Yeah, I was also wondering because um, we, we do many projects all over the world and um, in, in the US and Australia and in all over Europe. And, um, I, I think one of the things is that um, we're quite good in uh, working between the different scales. Um, and uh, also the regional and national scale is approached as a design uh, process. So like we did this design for all the rivers as a design image, how it could look and, and working through all these scales and not uh, doing planning only in a planning way, more like uh, rules and regulations and uh, strategy. It's really also spatial and it is also spatially represented. And you can see that in many national plans by landscape architects that they really show how Holland could look in 50 years. And um, I think this is a very strong point. So be able to make special images on a national and regional and a, a higher scale, but at the same time connected uh, designing to and fro between the detailing and the higher level. I think this, this is one uh, thing. Um, the other thing is that um, they're quite good at concepts uh, development, and, but maybe that's not that much different from uh, uh, countries like Denmark and Sweden and Germany and the UK because they're uh, also uh, quite advanced in conceptual thinking and uh, and maybe the 
Well, the third thing is that we are very much in this all this participation and consultation, and that's really integrated into the profession. And um, when there's a call, you really can show that you have experience and how to deal with the public, how to co-create uh, your designs with uh, others. So I think, well, these, the combination of these things are really uh, make sure that it's uh, very competitive. Yeah. Well, um, my last question before the questions from the audience is about your own design projects. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Jeron, because you are also a designer. Uh, yeah. Uh, how is your design uh, approach? How is your approach to the design? Maybe you, you, you would like to mention some specific projects of yours. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, my, my basic orientation is very much in planting design and ecological design, uh, combined with uh, sustainability. And um, so, so what, what in many cases in the projects I, I worked on, was that I tried to recreate and renovate habitats also, but also the nature experience uh, for people. And I, I did this in many uh, multidisciplinary teams uh, where sometimes I had a role as ecologist more, uh, sometimes more as planting designer. Sometimes I was the landscape architect and then somebody else was the urban planner and so. So I took different roles and I, I liked that in, uh, in a way. And, but, but I'm really very keen on making a, um, a design that's ecological sustainable. Uh, and I worked together with many landscape ecologists or ecologists as well, but they, they are missing the design approach and the, and the spatial approach. And I always want to translate from what is possible and how could it look like and how can you improve the situation for uh, well, the, the, the indigenous flora and fauna, in order to make uh, something that will work on the long run. So that, uh, but that's an important aspect of my approach. And and the other uh, aspect is that I really like all these uh, participation processes, to to just to work together with groups of people to see what they want in their city, in their town, for their park, and and. Uh, now, what, what ideas do they have? And I really want to engage them in this. That, uh, mm -hmm. I did not always succeed, but I, I like to do that, yeah. Okay, let's go to the question. Actually, there is one question on the screen now. It's, uh, the, the, I can't see who asked the question, but without proper landscape engineering, like infrastructure, drainage, or grading, we cannot have sustainable landscapes. Are yeah. landscape engineering courses given by universities during ma um, bachelor's and master's programs? You have yeah, already yeah. mentioned some courses, but maybe you can specifically... Yeah, I think um, the, the basic courses in, uh, in all the programs, they have landscape engineering. Um, it was the strongest in uh, Lyrenstein at first, uh, they were, and, but it's now also incorporated in Host and Bos. Um, in the academy, yes, well, maybe 10 years ago, they, they had very little about it. And then there were complaints that they didn't know anything about engineering and construction and so on. So they really entered some courses in this. And uh, also in Delft, now they uh, entered really this uh, engineering aspects. Actually, um, colleagues of my office, they gave lectures in uh, TU Delft. So it was, uh, and I was also, um, I, I, I called also, when I was director of the landscape course at Lyrenstein, I really said, well, we are, are uh, of course we are designers, but we also are craftsmen. And I, I had, myself, I was teaching for 10 years at vocational training uh, school for landscape engineers and constructors. Mm -hmm. So I really had this understanding that, well, it, it should come down to the ground as well. Um, and I think there is a balance, of course, between the different schools. Um, there is a different emphasis because in Wageningen and Delft, of course, they also need to include the research aspects much, much more in it. So you have only so much time in a course. So, so there's a difference, but it is always included in it. And the same goes for the planting design, although, uh, for instance, Larsen is stronger in the planting design. Wageningen is a bit less, uh, and then Delft is 
even a bit lesser, but it depends on the context of the school, of course, yeah. Okay. Uh, time is running very fast. We have only five minutes left. Oh. The question uh, is about the, the, uh, the consequences of the COVID-19. You know, it is yeah. discussed all around the world. Uh, mm -hmm. What do you talk in the Netherlands about the implications of COVID-19 on the landscape design in the future? Or that's all. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, there was uh, a special support by the National Association for Offices uh, where they encountered trouble with their work and how they could go on. And so there was special advice. Um, for the Netherlands, uh, well, we, we had not that very strict rules compared to Italy and Spain and France. Um, but for instance, in my office, well, what we really changed is that people work much more from home. And uh, we had to improve the ICT infrastructure also in the office in order to make the connections faster and make a better platform and, and change things in that. But for the rest, now at this moment, we work a bit in shifts because the office is not big enough for everybody. So one group comes on Monday, the other group comes on. Uh... But for the project at this moment, uh, they're, they're all running more or less the same. But what I expect is that uh, because of the economic decline, uh, maybe at the end of the year or beginning of next year, uh, we might have less commissions. There were also uh, some, of call, some of the calls, for instance, I was in a call in Spain, and they uh, just said, well, okay, we postpone it for a few months. So, uh, but, uh, so I think the actual office work was not that much affected in the Netherlands. Of course, the travel to projects outside Europe and to other countries, it was impeded. But so there was some delay in. Um, but at the same time, we found also new possibilities to collaborate in long distance. Yep. Um, for instance, while well, we, we had uh, the Note Institute, we gave this course in landscape education or democracy. And for instance, we use these uh, common platforms for designing. Um, in Wageningen, we use Miro, we use the mural. And there are a group of people can work at the same time, drawing and, and uh, thinking yeah. and discussing. So, so we discovered new things. Yes. So that had an impact, but it was also a bit of an innovation or a new possibility. Um, and also for the, um, the discussion with stakeholders, that's also, yeah, we couldn't meet the stakeholders uh, at a certain stage. So things were postponed, but that's coming back now gradually. Um, but we also found new tools on uh, using social media just to connect to stakeholders and, and give examples and do mock-ups. And uh, so it has an impact, but I, I, I think it made some changes, but it doesn't, it, it might reduce our possibilities in next year because maybe of uh, economic decline, but yeah. well, I'm not sure. Yeah. Okay. I, is it an up. answer? Uh, Actually, yeah. we have uh, <laughs> running out of the time. Jerome, okay, yeah. uh, on behalf of myself and also my association, I would like to, you to thank you very much uh, for joining us tonight and sharing us uh, information about the the education and the professional practice of landscape architecture in the Netherlands. Uh, we wish you all the best. And uh, yeah, thank you. I hope we, 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 soon, uh, we will soon each other very soon. Yeah, well, thank you very much for this opportunity. And uh, I, um, well, if there are any questions later on, I'll try to answer them. Okay. And I hope at least I answered your questions in a way that you it Thank was you productive. very much yeah, also yeah. to the audience for watching us and asking questions. Mm -hmm. And see you all. Good night. Yeah. Bye-bye. Okay. Good night. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.